Magandang hapon po sa bawat isa sa atin. Hapon. Uh, uh, inaan pa kayo. So, tayo po tayo lahat. Uh, simulan po natin itong uh, seminar on election and investigation. At ang iba po, alam ko, uh, nasa biyahe na rin. Uh, puro Pilipino tayo although yung iba mga mukhang Nepal gani <laughs> katulad ko uh, so welcome brothers and sisters uh, brothers from PCI far from Alcor um, yung lugar nila brother uh, uh, brother Rudy uh, malayo pa sa Alcor sa um, JCF Martia welcome sa NCCM Martia, uh, salamat at ang dito rin sila. At ang iba ay uh, panginihintay natin tayo po uh, simulan na ang gawain na ito, tayo po'y manilangin. Salamat Panginoon sa pagkakataon ito na kayo ang siyang nagdala sa amin sa tugal na ito upang muli patuloy kaming uh, nag-aaral, na ganun na kasulatan ng Panginoon. At uh, salamat sa availability ng bawat isa. Salamat Lord at uh, binigyan mo rin kami Panginoon ng uh, ilang araw na makakapagpahinga uh, sa iyo. At uh, pinupuli ka namin at uh, salamat at natapos na rin Panginoon ng uh, ayos, masaya pa ang buong buwan ng Panginoon. At uh, pinupuli ka namin Panginoon sa pagkakataon ito. And as we listen to uh, our facilitator, our teacher of God na ay pinalagyan niya sa hapon na ito, Kailangan namin, Lord, ang iyong banal na spirit ang siyang paunawa sa amin ang bukas ng aming puso't isipan ang klaro, Panginoon, ang mga bagay-bagay maaaring minsan ay uh, hindi namin lubusan ng mga nalang. We pray, Lord, for uh, continued protection in this place. Salamat po na uh, binigyan mo kami ng freedom na magkaroon ng ganitong gawain kapag sambal mo sa lugar na ito. Iglesia mo ito, ilagay niyo sa lugar na ito. Although it is a residential area. Salamat sa katapatan at kabutihan ninyo. Patuloy ninyo pinatago ang ingatan ng iglesia na ito dito sa lugar. Kailangan namin, Lord, ng mga kapatid namin uh, may video around the way, Lord. Sumamang sila na sila'y makarating. Dalangan namin, Lord, na ikaw ang siyang mas makikilala namin, mas mapu, ma, maunawaan sa pag-aaral na ito. Ang sagay ng Lord, ang aming focus ay ipapokus sa ating Panginoon sa Christ. Pinupuri ka namin at pinapasalamatan ang lahat ng natidalangin namin sa pangalaman ng Christ. Amen. Amen. Um, nice ko rin pong i-welcome ang ating kapatid from Satmi with Pastor Beda. Uh, it's been almost a year na uh, nakasama rin namin ng Indonesia nito. Andiyan siya? Yeah. Uh, 
magtiwala ang Panginoon na magturo sa atin kundi ang ating uh, kuya si Kuya Mar Kwenta po natin Maganda nga po po sa lahat na, <coughs> natutuwa po ako na pabalik ulit sa sa Qatar pagkatapos ng two weeks na say for those who do not understand the language of heaven, I speak in uh, English. Uh, people in Ghana may be claiming also that uh, the language in heaven is uh, Ghanaian. <laughs> Filipinos are also claiming that uh, our national language is the language in heaven. <coughs> Uh, the, the topic we are to discuss this afternoon is uh, a very hot topic, especially among uh, students of uh, Bible schools. Uh, for most of us, this may be a new, a new topic. Maaaring bago sa pandinig natin ito, but this has been the subject of debates among many Christians. <clears throat> Itong tungkol sa election and predestination. And uh, it would be to our advantage also to know what is being uh, believed by other Christians. First, to understand them so that we don't misrepresent them uh, and uh, so that also we may compare uh, their beliefs with ours and see where the greater light is. Uh, ganyan po talaga ang one, nag-investigate. Uh, right? uh, unfortunately, no one can claim monopoly of the truth. Yes. And this is uh, to our advantage also because if no one can claim monopoly of the truth, then we are dependent on each other in knowing the truth. Dahil kung uh, isang church lang ang pinagpala ng Diyos na nasa kanya na lahat, kawawa naman yung ba. Right? And we would be depending so much on that uh, particular church if that is the case. But God, in His wisdom, did not allow monopoly of the truth. Uh, all the theological systems that we know exist among Christians, all theological systems have their weaknesses as well as strength. And the truth probably lies in all the strengths put together. It has been observed that uh, all theological systems have their weaknesses and uh, strengths. And the truth most likely lies in all the strengths of these systems put together. Kaya hindi ko an, hindi, hindi, hindi po masama yung kukuha ka karito, kukuha ka doon, kukuha ka dyan, basta yung mga strengths ang uh, kukunin mo, right? Uh, some, some would uh, laugh at you if you have no specific theological system. That means uh, you get some from here, you get some from there, right? And put them together. Uh, some would stick to one theological system. Uh, no matter uh, if there are inconsistencies in the system, they will stick to it. But that is not uh, that is not really a healthy uh, approach. If you are a uh, 
a serious student of the Bible, and if you are a true seeker of truth, you had you have to admit that there is no one who has the monopoly of truth, and therefore, hindi mo pwede kunin yung isang theological system lang. Okay? <clears throat> now, at present, there are two uh, major camps in the understanding of election and predestination, and these camps are known as Calvinism and Arminianism. Uh, these two camps uh, or these two theological systems aroused during the uh, 16th century reformation as a result of the polarization of beliefs. Uh, when the Protestant Reformation broke away from the Roman Catholic Church, they formed different groups. And two major groups emerged out of these different groups. The Armenian group and the Calvinist group. But the question is, could there be, could there be another system to challenge these uh, two groups? I believe there is. And, and this is what we are going to study in our uh, seminar, <clears throat> there is a third and most uh, Christocentric way of looking at election and predestination. Right? This will be the outline of our uh, seminar. We will first talk about election. And there are four uh, points that we will look at the meaning of election in the Bible meaning of election in Christ because Ephesians 1 verse 4 says we that is uh, uh, God has chosen us in him that is in Christ so we will look at the meaning of election in Christ and then we will look at the purpose of election in Christ and then who are the elect referred to in the Bible? Who are these elect? <clears throat> and we will have uh, a question and answer session at the end of part A. And uh, part B will be predestination, the meaning of predestination in the Bible, meaning of predestination through Christ. And then we will have another session for questions and answers. <clears throat> now we can have a break in between uh, or whatever whatever we feel we need some uh, stretching. Yeah, stretching to do or uh, you become sleepy you know, already then we'll have some break <clears throat> we'll, we will uh, start with election and the meaning of election in the bible <clears throat> It is important for us, students of uh, the Bible, to understand what the writer's understanding of the words used in the Bible. It is important that we understand the words, how the writer understood it, and how the original recipients of the writings understood it. Mahalaga po yun. Kasi yung intent ng author, kailangan nating maunawaan. Words evolve over time. And there are words used in the scriptures which may have evolved at nagkaroon na ng different meanings sa panahon natin ngayon. And one of these is the word election. Okay? Especially in a democratic uh, country where there are elections being held to elect uh, leaders, political leaders, yung concept natin ng election has been shaped by that uh, knowledge. 
So meron tayong knowledge, current knowledge about things now, right? In our own context, in our own culture, in our own history, we have knowledge of some things and some words. And if we are not careful in reading the scriptures, we may actually put the meaning to the words that we know now into the words used in the Bible, like election. And it is unfortunate that such has been the case in the study of this uh, uh, word election, <clears throat> the human understanding of the word election has crept into the theological system. At dahil po dito yung concept ng election ng marami ay hindi na po sabi natin hindi na biblical yung concept nila. So we will study the meaning of election in the Bible. Now the meaning of election is revealed in time and history. Meaning of God's actions in eternity past, such as election, because Ephesians 1 verse 4, which is our main uh, text for this seminar, Ephesians 1 verse 4 says that God chose us in Christ before the foundation of the world. In other words, before time uh, began, God made a divine action called election. Okay? But because God revealed himself in history, you cannot actually philosophize a meaning of election way back in eternity past and come up with the right with the right uh, meaning. In other words, you cannot peep into eternity past to determine what was the meaning of a divine action. In this case, election. What was the meaning of the divine action of election in eternity past? You will not find the answer there. Why? Because God revealed himself in time and history. <clears throat> and this revelation of God is recorded in the scriptures. You will be, you will find that the Bible starts with Genesis, which means the beginning of things, right? That is the beginning of history. That is the beginning of human history. That was the beginning of divine revelation. <coughs> it was not uh, accidental that Genesis is the first book of the Bible. It was divinely ordained that Genesis starts the revelation of God in history. So we will not we will not understand the meaning of a word or the meaning of an action of God that happened in eternity past, right? By <coughs> philosophizing, by in, by investigating, right? And peeping into that uh, into that eternity past to know the meaning of the divine action. You will not find the answer there. Why? Because God has not revealed himself in eternity past. He has revealed himself in history. Right? That is the difference uh, between revelation as Christianity knows it, and revelation as other religions know it. Sa atin, historical ang ating one. Uh, revelation o pagpapahayag ng Diyos ng kanyang sarili. sarili. God revealed himself by acting in human history. And that history is now recorded in the Bible. So we will look at the meaning of election which was an action of God in eternity past. We will look at the meaning of that by looking at God's acts of election in time and history. So we will see how God elected people in history, right? In the history recorded in the Bible. How did God elect people in history? And by 
Studying God's action in history of electing people, we will know the real meaning of biblical election. We can now we can project the meaning into the action of God in, eter in eternity past by looking at the action of God in history. Now there are several people whom God elected in history. <coughs> Right? From God's acts of electing people in time and history, we can know the meaning and principle of divine election. God elected Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob to be the ancestors of the Christ, the promised seed of Abraham. And this was what God told Abraham when he chose him out of many people during his time. From the city of Ur, God chose Abraham. And this is what God told Abraham. I will bless those who bless you. I will curse him who curses you. And in you, that is in Abraham, all the families of the earth shall be blessed. Note that the election of Abraham did not mean the rejection of all others, but their blessing instead. Malino <clears throat> yan. <clears throat> Right? That's very clear. The, this, the election of Abraham, God choosing Abraham, did not mean the rejection of all others. God chose the family of Abraham. Abraham and his family. For a, a very specific purpose. But it did not mean that God rejected all the families of the earth. When he chose Abraham and his family. But instead, instead of rejecting the rest of the families of the world, God said that through Abraham, or in Abraham, all the families of the earth shall be blessed. So here we see a principle that is actually contrary to the common knowledge about election. Right? Divine election does not mean the rejection of those not elected. But instead, the blessing of those not elected through the elect. Okay? Isaac and Jacob inherited from Abraham the same election and promises of God. We will look at some of the verses where we can gather, you know, the certain observations and come to a conclusion of what biblical election really means. Sojourn in this land, and uh, this is now God talking to Isaac. Sojourn in this land, and I will be with thee, and will bless thee. For unto thee and unto thy seed, I will give all these countries, and I will perform the oath which I swear unto Abraham thy father. And I will make thy seed to multiply as the stars of heaven. And I will give unto thy seed all these countries. And in thy seed shall all the nations of the earth be blessed. It's the same promise. Right? As instead of rejecting all others <coughs> upon the election of Isaac, the election of Isaac meant the blessing of all other nations not elected. Okay? Note again, the election of Isaac did not mean the rejection of those not elected, but their blessing instead. Right. Now here is the election of Jacob. And behold, the Lord stood above it and said, I am the Lord God of Abraham, your father, and the God of Isaac, the land on which you, <coughs> you lie, I will give to you and your descendants. Also your descendants shall be as the dust of the earth. <coughs> you shall spread abroad to the west and to the east, to the north and the south. In you and in your seed, all the families of the earth shall be blessed. So this is a recurring pattern of how God elected people in history. Again, take note, the election of Jacob did not mean the rejection of those not elected, 
but their blessing instead. Alright. And not only this, this is uh, what the Apostle Paul explains about the election of these uh, uh, patriarchs of the Israelites, the fathers of the Israelites. And not only this, right, according to this, the commentary of the Apostle Paul on the election of the fathers of Israel. And not only this, but when Rebecca, uh, who is the wife of Isaac, also had conceived by one man, even by our father Isaac, for the children not yet being born, nor having done any good or evil, that the purpose of God according to election might stand, not of works, but of him who calls. It was said to her, the older, that is Esau, shall serve the younger. As it is written, Jacob I have loved, but Esau I have hated. Right? Yan ang commentary. So, here, the Apostle Paul understood that Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob were elected <coughs> by God. Right? And so that the purpose of election might stand in the case of Jacob, uh, God prophesied that Esau would serve Jacob, which is the younger. And Jacob, it says here, Jacob I have loved, but Esau I have hated. Now, this is <coughs> hyperbolic language. Okay? Do not take that literally. Right? You know what uh, hyperbolic language means? Uh, hyperbole. Hyperbole is a uh, style, literary style, <coughs> using exaggeration in order to drive home a point. If you want to emphasize something, you exaggerate. Right? Like, uh, I cried a bucket full of tears. It doesn't mean that, you know, <laughs> you measured your tears uh, yes, it and it, it filled the bucket. No, he just said that you cried a lot. Right? <laughs> uh, when Jesus said, it is, uh, it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of the needle than for a rich man to go to heaven. He, he did not mean that there would be no rich man in heaven or impossible. See, it is impossible for the camel to go through the, the eye of a needle. Okay? It does not mean that there won't be rich people in heaven. It only means it is extremely difficult for rich people to get to heaven. Because obviously, you know, they can buy everything uh, they want, all the pleasures of this earth will, uh, is at their, or are at their disposal. So the temptation is greater for uh, rich people. Okay? <clears throat> it only means it's difficult, not impossible. Now here, it means that Jacob was loved by God so much so that if the love of God between Jacob and uh, and Esau is compared, you know, it would seem that God hated Esau. Right? In some modern translations, you will you will have this as as it is written, Jacob loved uh, God loved Jacob much more than Esau. Yun lang po ibig sabihin no. Okay? <clears throat> Otherwise, you would have to hate your mother and father also in order to be a disciple of Jesus Christ. <laughs> because Jesus Christ said, unless you hate your mother and your father, your brother and your sister, your wife and children, you cannot be my disciple. Hate. You don't take that as uh, a literal literal statement. It is hyperbole, hyperbolic statement. It means unless you love God more than this, right? You cannot be my disciple. You like this of you. Alright, so it doesn't mean that God really hated Jacob in the sense that he really, you know, in the sense that we hate. Right? People hate. In fact, 
<coughs> during their lifetime, Esau was more uh, was richer than uh, Jacob. Right? You remember when uh, the two brothers were about to meet, and uh, Jacob, in order to appease his brother, whom he thought was still angry with him, because he he usurped the blessing of the firstborn, right? He he prepared gifts, you know, many uh, uh, flocks, flocks of animals. I think uh, into hundreds or even thousands. And this was his per first party. Uh, yung kanyang uh, kwan, entourage, first entourage to meet uh, Esau. <coughs> and, but when they met, and uh, Jacob offered all these gifts to his brother, his brother said, no. no. I, have, I have more than this. <laughs> he was richer than, uh, than Jacob. Okay? So God did not really hate Esau in the sense that, uh, you know, in the sense of hate. But God loved Jacob so much, more than Esau, because Jacob would be the ancestor of the Christ. Amen. Right? That's the only reason <coughs> why God loved Jacob so much more than Esau. Right? From these examples of divine election in history, we can say that biblical election means God chooses one in order to bless the many who are not chosen. Because of the importance of knowing the real meaning of biblical election, let us look at more examples of divine election in history. Now let's consider this, <clears throat> the election of Israel. Yet here now, O Jacob, my servant, and Israel, whom I have chosen. Jesus sums up the purpose of God for choosing Israel. You remember this conversation between a Samaritan woman and Jesus Christ by the side of the well. Right? Jesus said to the woman, salvation is of the Jews. Remember that? It was God's purpose in electing Israel that she should be the depository of truth about salvation. <clears throat> the clearest object lesson in, uh, of salvation was given to Israel. <coughs> Israel's elaborate sacrificial system in the temple was the clearest object lesson God could give about salvation next only to its reality in Jesus Christ. So Israel had that object lesson about salvation in their sacrificial system. Their sacrificial system taught so much about how God would save man. From sin and death. And it was the purpose of God that through this knowledge that Israel had, this knowledge of salvation might be brought to the Gentiles as well. The same truth about divine election is shown in the election of Israel. And God chooses one nation in order to bless <coughs> all the nations of the earth with the knowledge of salvation. Now, the greatest example of divine election, of course, is Jesus Christ, right? The ultimate elect of God. And this is what uh, Isaiah uh, said about, what God said about Jesus Christ, right? In prophecy. Behold, my servant whom I uphold, my elect one in whom my soul delights. I have put my spirit upon him. He will bring forth justice to the Gentiles. I will keep you and give you as a covenant to the people, as a light to the Gentiles. That you is this elect one, which is Jesus Christ. Okay? <clears throat> to, open the, the blind, uh, to open blind eyes, to bring our pris out prisoners from the prison, those who sit in darkness from the prison house. You remember another passage in uh, Isaiah where it says, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me to bring good news to the poor, to open the eyes of the blind, and so on and so forth. This is uh, Messianic prophecy. 
Jesus is called the elect one. Other translations call him the chosen one. <clears throat> All right. Jesus also chose during his time. And this, uh, this election of Jesus Christ of the 12 disciples also illustrate the meaning of election. You did not choose me, he said to his disciples, but I chose you and appointed you that you would go and bear fruit and that your fruit would remain. So the selection, the selection or the, the choosing of the 12 did not mean the rejection of all others. Through this chosen few, the 12, the message of the gospel of Christ has been proclaimed throughout the world. We are all fruit of their labor. Okay? After doing a survey of how God elected people in time and history, we are now ready to define what divine election really means in the Bible. Divine election means God chooses one or a few in order to bless the many who were not chosen. From this <coughs> biblical definition of election, we can draw up certain conclusions. Remember this? Huh? Right? <coughs> Divine election does not mean God's rejection or abandonment of those not elected, but their blessing instead. Okay? Divine election is purposeful. God has always a purpose for electing one or a few. And the purpose is, of course, to bless the many who were not chosen. Okay? Yan po ang purpose. <clears throat> this biblical meaning of election with its conclusions has very negative implications upon the two most commonly held views on election, the Calvinist and the Arminian views. The Calvinist view of election. In Calvinism, election means that by his sovereign will alone, <coughs> God unconditionally chose some to salvation and abandoned the rest of humanity to perish in hell. Here is a quote from Lorraine Butler, a renowned, world-renowned Calvinist that summarizes the Calvinist view of election. And this is what he says. The very terms elect and election imply the terms non-elect and reprobation. Okay? This is using philosophy. We are warned by the Apostle Paul about philosophy. In its right use, philosophy is good. Even the Apostle Paul used philosophy. Right? The other apostles used philosophy. God himself said, come, let us reason together. So, philosophy per se is not really bad. But if you use philosophy to come to a view that is not supported by the Bible, then it becomes bad. And this is what the Apostle Paul warns us against. Philosophy. Right? It's though, the very terms elect and election imply the terms not elect and reprobation. That is, that is uh, what we call as uh, logic, right? If this is white, then there must be black, okay? Or if this is, if there is black, there must be white. Now, that that does not apply always, right? When you study the Bible, that does not apply always. It is always safe to stop where the Bible stops. Okay? Do not go beyond. Even if it is logical, do not go beyond. Okay? <clears throat> There is no such term as non-elect in the Bible, by the way. And there is no such term as reprobation. Right? A reprobation means, uh, one, yung, uh, 
doom, right? Uh, dumb. Right? God dumb certain people and save other people. This is the uh, concept of the lecture that is being propagated here. When some are chosen out, chosen out, others are left not chosen. The high privileges and glorious destiny of the former are not shared with the latter. Again, be very careful with this kind of uh, philosophy. Right? As we have seen, divine election means God chooses one in order to bless the many who are not elected. Now, according to this, the blessings, the blessings of the elect are not shared with those not elected. That is exactly contrary to what biblical election is. Right? The high privileges and glorious destiny of the former, that is those chosen out, are not shared with the latter. That is not true. Okay? Why? Because divine election means... Right? Through the elect, God would bless those not elected. Amen? This too is of God. Ah, that claim is not true. We believe that from all eternity, God has intended to leave some of Adam's posterity in their sins. And that the decisive factor in the life of each is to be found only in God's will. As Mosley has said, the whole race after the fall was one mass of perdition, and it pleased God of his sovereign mercy to rescue some and to leave others where they were, to raise some to glory, giving them such grace as necessarily qualified <coughs> them for it, and abandon the rest from those whom we withheld such grace to eternal punishment. Right? <clears throat> this is written by uh, Lorraine Butler in his book, Unconditional Election. This goes against the principle of biblical election. Okay? <clears throat> the Armenian view. In Armenianism, <coughs> election means that by his foreknowledge of who will believe, God conditionally chose some to salvation and abandoned the rest of humanity to perish in hell. Here is a quote that summarizes the Armenian view of election from the five articles of remonstrance. Uh, this is a gathering of people who believe in Arminianism, right? Remonstrance. And they came up with five articles of their belief. And this is article one. That God, by an eternal, unchangeable purpose in Jesus Christ, His Son, before the foundation of the world, had determined out of fallen, the fallen sinful race of men to save in Christ, for Christ's sake, and through Christ, those who, through the grace of the Holy Ghost, shall believe on this His Son, Jesus, and shall persevere in His, in his faith and obedience of faith through this grace, even to the end, and on the other hand, to leave the incorrigible and unbelieving in sin and under wrath, and to condemn them as alienate from Christ. According to the word of the gospel in John 3, 36, He that believeth on the Son hath everlasting life, and he that believeth not the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God abideth on him and according to the other passages of Scripture also. Both the Calvinist and Armenian views are not based on the biblical meaning of an election according to the <coughs> election in time and history, but rather on the common human understanding of election, that election implies the rejection of those not elected. That's our concept of election, and that is the human concept of election, not God's concept of election. Right? Election is just passed in the Philippines and the 
Filipinos decided on who to put in our uh, positions of authority in the in the in our political system. <clears throat> when we choose one, we reject the others, right? This is our human understanding of election. <clears throat> Which, unfortunately, those who study the Bible have actually uh, used this meaning that they know about election in order to come up with this concept of election, like the Calvinist and the Armenian concepts of election. That God choosing some to salvation necessarily means the abandonment or the rejection of those not elected. But again, that is not divine election. Divine election, as we have seen it, is God choosing one or a few in order to bless the many who are not chosen. Amen. It's a very simple uh, definition of biblical election. But unfortunately, it was missed by those who have developed these theological systems. It was missed. All right. <clears throat> Both Calvinist and Armenian views of election have no precedence in biblical history where God chose a person or a people and rejected or abandoned those not chosen. There is no precedence in biblical history. In other words, you cannot find a history in the Bible where God chose some or a few and then rejected them or abandoned the rest to perish in hell or to perish. There is no such precedence. So, wala pong example, right? Walang example sa Bible. Yung klase ng election na yan. <clears throat> This is a very serious oversight on the part of the proponents of these views. The human understanding of election has been forced upon scriptures that speak about election. Another serious shortcoming of the Calvinist and Armenian views of election is their lack of purpose for <coughs> elect towards those not elected. God's purpose of election is for the elect to bless the many who are not elected. And this is unfortunately lacking in the views of the Calvinists and the Armenians. Considering the very explicit passages of scriptures that God loves all of mankind and that he desires all men to be saved, the biblical meaning of divine election is perfectly consistent with this divine intention whereas both Calvinism and Arminianism are not. In the Bible, there are very explicit passages that say God wants to save all. He does not want any to perish. Right? For God so loved the world, the whole world, that he gave his only begotten son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. That whoever is that world. <clears throat> now some would read this as the world of the elect. <laughs> but according to the theological system, itself, the elect would come to faith because God will give them faith. Right? <clears throat> so, there is no chance for the elect not to believe. So why? Right? For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have everlasting life. If this is the world of the elect, this is this is Irrelevant. Yes. Whoever believes in him shall not perish, but yes. have everlasting life. Mm. That is irrelevant. Yes. If that is the world, the world. Correlating, eh? but, yeah. but 
If you read the three uh, verses after this, you will find that the world mentioned here contains people who believe dark or who want, who love darkness and people who love light. In this world, there are people who believe and those who do not believe. So this is the world that contains all the people. Right? This is not the world of the elect. <clears throat> Otherwise, this becomes irrelevant. Okay? <clears throat> God, who desires all men to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. This verse is so explicit. He desires all men to be saved. And here is again. The Lord is not slack. This is uh, in the context of the second coming of Jesus Christ being delayed. From human point of view. This is what Peter said. The Lord is not slack concerning his promise. As some count slackness. But is long suffering toward us. Not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. But we see Jesus, who was made a little lower than the angels, for the suffering of death, crowned with glory and honor, that he, by the grace of God, might taste death for every one. For the love of Christ compels us because we judge thus that if one died for all, then all died. And he died for all. That those who live should live no longer for themselves, but for him who died for them and rose again. He died for all. He tasted death for everyone. And he himself is the propitiation for our sins. And not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. Again, so this is the intention of God. This is the desire of God. That all men might be saved. That no one should perish. And then you have this view on election that God selected some for salvation and rejected or abandoned the rest to perish in hell. It does not, it does not go in line with this expression of God's intention. <coughs> Both Calvinism and Arminianism's view on election are not in line with God's explicit, expressed intention to save all men. That all men will not be saved eventually. And the reason for this sad truth, the Bible is also very explicit about. The intention of God is to save all. Amen? Amen. Amen. He does not want anyone to perish. To perish. Amen. He said, I have no pleasure in the death of him who dies. God does not have pleasure in death. For the one who dies. But then, if you will hold on to these views, <coughs> the Calvinism view and the Armenian view of election, you will have to, to believe also that God is not really serious about these statements. Mm -hmm. Why? Because he, he selected only some side to save mm -hmm. <laughs> and abandoned and rejected the others in damnation. So he is not really serious about this. Yes. You, you, can you see the conflicting uh, yes. the conflicting element between these views and the express in, intention of God to save all? Okay? <clears throat> Alright. Now we come to the meaning of election in Christ. Now we know what divine election means. It means God chose one or a few in order to bless the many who were not chosen. Now we will know, we will try to understand the election in Christ. One central passage is election, Ephesians 1.4. 
which is used both by Calvinists and Armenians, where it says, just as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and blameless before him. Right? We learn that divine election means God chose one or a few in order to bless the many who were not chosen. We will apply this biblical meaning of election to Ephesians 1.4. Aside from the meaning of divine election, another key to the proper understanding of Ephesians 1.4 is the meaning of the Pauline expression in Him or in Christ. What does Paul mean by this expression? Christians have taken for granted and assumed they know the meaning of this Pauline expression. In order to answer this question, we need a survey of the passages in scriptures where Paul used this expression, in him or in Christ. There are two groups of passages I want to focus on. One group of passages, passages is with divine actions or verbs uh, attached to in Christ, and passages with descriptions called adjectives, also attached to in Christ or in, in him. We'll apply the literary grammatical principle of hermeneutics in these passages. <clears throat> now, I want you to take note of this. God, uh, the Bible does not simply say, God or He chose us before the foundation of the world. It says, God chose us in Him. You remember this, uh, our yeah. This is actually a book, right? I just inserted this. Right? I just wrote that. This is not part of the title of the book. <laughs> this is the book, Chosen Before the Foundations of the Earth. I, I ask here, what is missing here? Chosen before the foundations of the earth. What is missing here? In him. Chosen in Him. Right? And this is always the one being missed in explaining Amen. Ephesians 1 4. But it makes all the difference how you understand the verse. <coughs> Let's see. Just as he chose us in him, often this is scratched out. They just say, chosen us before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and blameless before him. If you delete that, right, then you come to a very wrong conclusion about election. All right. <clears throat> now let us see. Verses with divine actions attached to in him or in Christ. We will now survey six, right? I'm not saying there are only six. There are many, okay? We will only survey, time will only allow us to survey six of these passages containing the expression in Christ or in Him. We will stay in Ephesians to ensure we are in the same context, right? We will stay in Ephesians here for these verbs. Ephesians 1 3 says, God hath blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ. It says, God has blessed us. Past tense. The us in the verse verses we are surveying refers to regionally, refers originally to Paul and the Ephesian believers. However, the eternally valid truths in it is for all believers, including us. According to the verse, we have already been blessed by God with all His spiritual blessings. The question is, do we now have all His spiritual blessings in ourselves? Do we now have all the spiritual blessings in ourselves? <coughs> the obvious answer is no. Okay? <laughs> The answer is quite obvious, no. In fact, 
you know, if you have all the spiritual blessings, you should have a glorified body right now. Right. 